Hey, Apple Friday. This week, Apple's AI exposed Microsoft's biggest weakness. The exciting new RAM standard is coming to computers, big and small, and Samsung showed off some really exciting new chip technologies. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Nebula. Okay, this week we're starting not with the brief, but instead with the first story. Unless you've been blissfully on a vacation somewhere, you've probably heard that Apple did a thing, and primarily an AI thing. And I wanted to contrast this with Microsoft's newest AI blunders for the full effect. So at WWDC, Apple, as usual, announced updates for every one of its operating systems with the expected yearly feature drops with new customization options, plus a few useful things like password managers and an extremely fancy calculator for the iPad. But the clear focus of the entire event was Apple Intelligence, a comprehensive generative AI system developed by Apple and integrated into every part of Apple's operating systems. It can do all the expected things like generate images or magically erase people from photos or re write your badly worded emails so that your boss won't fire you, etc. Feature-wise, this is more or less the same stuff that we've seen from other players, but Apple's real claim for differentiation is, of course, privacy. They say that as much of this AI as possible runs locally on your device. They say that whenever a bigger model is needed, it falls back on a special cloud that Apple has developed, which they claim is super private. And whenever the system needs to get access to a third party like ChatGPT, the user explicitly gets asked to confirm. This private context was pretty widely celebrated as a great thing, and everyone largely reported it as more or less an actual fact. Apple is surely keeping your data private. Sure, the AI can access a ton of personal data about you, it can screen record basically every app that it wants to, it can send all of that data to a cloud if it wants to, even one that directly belongs to Apple, but because much of this is done typically on device and because Apple says it's private, I guess it's private. And I have to say, I mostly believe Apple here as well, which really puts Microsoft's latest fiasco around recall into context. So Windows Recall was announced with, theoretically, many very similar privacy claims. It's an AI system deeply integrated into Microsoft's operating system, which Microsoft promised would run only offline on your really powerful NPU to preserve your privacy. So even though it had access to a crazy amount of information about you, that shouldn't have worried you. Sounds kind of similar to Apple, but unlike Apple's AI, the internet instantly decided that Recall was a massive privacy invasion from the millisecond it was announced, and people simply chose to not believe any of Microsoft's claims around privacy. Security researchers quickly declared Recall as a security disaster as soon as they saw it, and as a result of the backlash, Microsoft had announced updates to Recall, making it opt-in for all users, as well as adding encryption technologies that really should have been there from the start. And this week, the company has even pulled the previous you build that Recall kind of soft launched in. Hey, Editing Martin here, and it turns out that after I finished filming the episode, Microsoft officially delayed the launch of the Recall feature until they fixed their security issues completely, so it is not even going to launch together with the Copilot Plus PCs, so things are getting even worse for them. Now, part of the problem is, of course, that Microsoft launched a feature that was genuinely not as private and as secure as it probably should have been from the start. But people instantly rejected what Microsoft was doing before any of these concerns were actually confirmed, which points to a much bigger problem, Microsoft having absolutely no trust with its user base, which is kind of the exact opposite of what Apple has. Microsoft not only completely messed up this specific rollout, but the company also has such a massive accumulated amount of mistrust from shoving every single square inch of Windows and their services full with ads and tracking and crappy MSN news and whatever, that people just disbelieve them by default. That is the exact opposite of the reaction that Apple got, whose privacy claims were simply accepted as true before anyone ever got to test them. And I actually hope that Microsoft learns out of this experience, because especially in the era of AI where so much personal data and everything else is on the line, trust is more important than ever. So they better start earning it. Okay, for my second story of the week, do you remember this new kind of RAM that we talked about a few weeks ago, LP Cam 2, that was supposed to make replaceable RAM in laptops a thing? Well, this week, first, its cousin, called Cam 2, showed up in desktop motherboards at Computex from the likes of MSI, Asus, and ASRock, and second, a Steam Deck competitor from the Taiwanese company A-Data included it in a handheld gaming prototype as well. And as a reminder, these are now the second and the third category featuring this new RAM standard after they were spotted in laptops 
laptops just a few weeks ago. Now the handheld is not coming to market until next year and the actual availability of the desktop motherboards will take some time as well, but it's a good sign that the tech will be adopted relatively soon and in multiple categories too, not just the laptops like we might have originally assumed. In desktops, the benefit is that you get much smaller modules that also don't stick out, which might be especially attractive for smaller builds, plus regardless of the size, there's supposedly better signal integrity and better power efficiency as well. For now, the prices of Cam2 memory seem pretty high, but most of the opinions that I could find have said that the prices should probably come down over time as mass manufacturing kicks in, so I guess yay for Cam2 everywhere. Okay, and for my third story of the week, Samsung's chip business is staging a comeback in two key ways. First, the company announced that it will be ready to start mass producing 2 nanometer chips for mobile devices in 2025. These will use gate all around technology, which Samsung says is ahead of TSMC by two to three years. Now, TSMC has of course handily beaten Samsung without gate all around technology so far, so this doesn't necessarily mean that Samsung will dethrone them, but it's a good sign that they'll get to two nanometers relatively quickly. And second, Samsung also has a whole plan for becoming the leading maker of AI chips, and this plan is all about memory. Historically, Samsung's foundry business and memory chip business were run independently, but AI chips need tons and tons of specialized high bandwidth memory, and Samsung is now saying that it will integrate its two businesses into something called Samsung AI solutions that will offer much faster turnaround times and also better memory integrations. Only time can tell if that will help. Okay, and moving on to the brief, we start with the sad news that Jabra announced that it will end its consumer earbud business. Not a huge surprise as they haven't had any big hits lately, but kinda sad. Next, the hip social media app called BeReal that prompts you once a day at a random time to post a real photo to your friends is being acquired for half a billion euros. The new owner, Voodoo, is a French company, same as BeReal, and I really hope that they can boost the app. It's actually still low-key one of my favorite social apps, so fingers crossed. Moving on, the Pixel 8 series now has USB-C to DisplayPort functionality, which together with continuous leaks from source code, is fueling rumors that Android will get a proper desktop mode like Samsung DeX really soon. Would be cool. And in kind of related news, we've also learned that Windows may soon add your Android phone to File Explorer using PhoneLink, which would be a super useful feature. I use PhoneLink all the time, it works great on a Samsung phone, so I'd really like this. Moving on, Sam Altman this week said that OpenAI managed to double its annualized revenue to $3.4 billion. That is really impressive, even if this is an unverified statement and even if we don't know anything about profitability just yet. Apparently, the new Apple partnership will not help them increase revenues though, as we've recently learned that Apple will be paying them for ChatGPT on their iPhones through distribution instead of cash. You know when a company hires an artist and tells them that they'll be paid in exposure? This is Apple doing that with OpenAI. <laughs> Okay, and for our release monitor, we start with the brand new Galaxy Watch FE, which is the first ever FE model of a Galaxy Watch. The tech inside is pretty last gen, but for $199, maybe that's okay. Moving on, the Insta360 GO 3S is also here, and this is a small but nice upgrade over the 3. It can now do 4K instead of 2.7K, and generally has noticeably better image quality, along with a few features like Apple Find My. The price is still $400, just like in the last generation, but the trade-off is that the battery life is now a little bit shorter than before. And talking of funky cameras, Apple teased first a new lens from Canon, and then a whole upcoming camera from Blackmagic, designed specifically for shooting immersive video for the Vision Pro. The Blackmagic one even has a separate sensor for each of its lenses. Kinda cool. Moving on, it seems like HTC is still making phones somehow, and they now have a new model in the form of the U24 Pro. It's somehow even not a completely terrible deal at $549 and pretty decent mid-range specs. As a contrast, the new Lightphone 3 is also out, and this is definitely a questionable deal. It's the third generation of the company's distraction-free phones, with the big new updates being that it now has a camera and an OLED screen, which is nice, but the price also inexplicably jumped from $350 to $800 this year. $800 for the most basic of phones imaginable? Uh, no, man. Oh well, that's it for the news, but uh, what's that? You want even more news delivered like this from other creators as well? But then check this out. 
Nebula has recently launched Nebula News. It's a dedicated space inside Nebula to catch up with everything that's happening around the world with no distractions. The Friday checkout is a part of it. Morning Brew has just joined, bringing all of their shows to Nebula. We have brand new news-focused original series like War Room. The team behind TLDR News is curating the whole thing, and it's just a fantastic way to stay up to date with news that you can actually trust and without getting bombarded by ads and unnecessary junk. Including this very ad, you could be watching the next Nebula News video already. What an experience that would be. I really enjoy having a platform that only hosts smart and thoughtful content, and Nebula is of course our very own video streaming service built and owned by educational creators, including me, Wendover Productions, Polymatter, Real Engineering, and more. It is full of our regular videos beside just the news as well. There are many Nebula original series and you get early access a lot of times with no ads and no tracking either. Signing up really helps to support our work directly and if you use my link in the description, you'll also get an extra discount. My link brings the cost down to just $30 a year. Mind you, that is for a full year, not a month. And if you don't like ongoing subscriptions, you can also instead opt for a lifetime membership. There are multiple options to choose from. Be sure to use my link in the description, check it out, and I'll see you next Friday.